Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab, all on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. I'm Pete Daly, CEO and publisher of the U.S. Naval Institute. And on behalf of the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the Naval Institute, we're proud to bring you this continuation of our Maritime Security Dialogue series. This series is made possible through the generous sponsorship of Huntington Ingalls Industries. Today's topic on diversity, equity, and inclusion is extremely well-timed given the national conversation that is ongoing. And our guest today is Chief of Naval Personnel, Vice Admiral John Nall a USNA grad who holds a Master of Science in Weapons Systems Engineering from the Naval Postgraduate School. He's a career surface warfare officer and his operational tours have spanned the Atlantic and the Pacific fleets to include forward deployed Naval forces in Europe and the Western Pacific. Ashore, Admiral Now served as the director of the Navy Senate Liaison Office in Washington. As a flag officer, Admiral Now has served as the chief of staff and Director for Strategy, Resources and Plans, N58, at the staff of Commander U.S. Naval Forces Europe and Africa and Sixth Fleet in Naples, Italy. He was Commander, Amphibious Force, Seventh Fleet, Expeditionary Strike Group, Seven, and Task Force 76 in Okinawa. Most recently, he was Director, Military Personnel Plans and Policy, N13. We welcome Vice Admiral John Nall today as the Navy's 59th Chief of Naval Personnel. And interviewing Vice Admiral Nile will be Dr. Alice Hunt Friend, who is a senior fellow in the International Security Program at CSIS. And I will now turn it over to Dr. Friend and Vice Admiral Nile. Thank you. Um, Vice Admiral Nile, thank you so much for joining us for this important conversation. I just wanted to start off uh, sort of on a personal note with you. Um, the Navy and you yourself have been emphasizing the need to recognize how racism and other kinds of bias have affected the lives of sailors. Um, what has been your experience? How does your own education and background and what you've seen over the course of your Navy career inform your efforts in this space? Um, doctor, thanks. And <clears throat> let me just also say uh, thank you to Vice Admiral Daly, who uh, certainly has been a longtime role model and a, and a mentor for so many of us. Um, I, I think that throughout my career, what I've seen is that if you look at great ships, um, they by definition have an inclusive and diverse team. And that's, that is, um, that's diverse, not just with respect to race or ethnicity or gender, uh, but based upon where you went to school, Admiral Daly, as we were talking earlier, uh, it went to a ROTC uh, unit. Um, he came away with a different experience there. I went to the Naval Academy. Mine was a little bit different, but when you blend those differences together in an inclusive workplace, it just makes a team higher performing. So it's about readiness. And, and so I have seen that and seen it up close uh, and personal. And, and certainly I know we'll talk more uh, about what we're hearing in our listening sessions, but I think that's also brought home where perhaps I thought personally that, that we had made more progress uh, than perhaps uh, we had, but we know how important that inclusivity is uh, to form the best war fighting team. And as the Navy's in great power competition, never before, uh, or at least not recently, has it been as important to make sure that we have teams that are as ready as we can make them? Uh, so, uh, so I look forward to our discussion today. Sir, you mentioned manpower um, and readiness, and you, of course, are in charge of manpower readiness for the Navy. Do you think equity and inclusion are readiness issues? I, I think uh, equity and inclusion are huge uh, war fighting readiness um, issues. And, and quite frankly, um, here tomorrow, we'll have a chance to talk to all of the four-star admirals in Navy billets uh, in the Navy, PAC fleet, fleet forces, Naval forces Europe, as well as the CNO and the vice chief 
on, uh, on our Inclusion and Diversity Council. Um, and, and that is a council that really looks hard at how are we doing in this space? How are we, we developing our leaders, both officer and enlisted? And how are we leveraging the power uh, of that, uh, that in, in inclusive approach? So Admiral Gilday, uh, the Chief of Naval Operations, of course, stood up Task Force One Navy in July um, in response to the racial justice movement expanding across the country, but also in response to concerns about the Navy's own ongoing struggle with racial bias. Um, can you describe briefly the mandate for the task force and tell us how it's been going about its work? Sure. So the, the task force, the idea is not <clears throat> that that the Navy has not been active in trying to uh, trying to address inclusion and diversity. We we have uh, we have looked hard over the years, um, but arguably, um, if you look just at you know when I go to a meeting at the Pentagon and I look around the table, I see too many people that look exactly like me. And you could extrapolate that to other places. So um, and but and so in recognizing that the nation and the Navy are at an inflection point as we look at what happened uh, with, uh, with the death of George Floyd. Um, we realized that, that we needed um, to accelerate uh, the action that we were taking. And that was, that was why we stood up Task Force One Navy. Um, the idea is um, to, to do a deliberate sprint uh, with really a cross-cutting team, a very diverse team, um, that will help the Navy uh, spot areas that we may have missed, that there's uh, opportunities there to accelerate areas that we were already going down specific initiatives, and, and then to make sure that we were fully and actively listening um, to our sailors. Uh, and, and I would officer, offer that that's officers enlisted and our civilians to try and make sure that we, we understand what does it look like through their lens? Um, what are the barriers? How do we remove those systemic barriers so that we do better here in forming those diverse uh, teams? So the task force report is due in December, of course. Um, can you give us any previews of what you've heard so far, what you found out? Sure. So um, at first I'd note that, that, um, that the Navy's effort, like the other services, we are um, we are acting uh, parallel to what the Secretary of Defense is doing with his own uh, diversity efforts. And he has a, a diversity board uh, that he has stood up. And it's also looking at a number of different recommendations. I think they've got, they've had 78 that specific uh, recommendations uh, that they have looked at. Uh, they've taken 15 to either act on immediately or look at near term. Uh, an example of that was removing photos uh, from boards to try and make sure that, that if there's any uh, unconscious or conscious bias, that that's not a factor. Um, but so Task Force One Navy um, is, uh, is also looking at where do we recommend changes uh, for the Navy across four different lines of effort, Doctor. So we're looking specifically at, at recruiting uh, at how we do talent management and retention, uh, at professional development. How do we develop our leaders, officer and enlisted across both character and competence with inclusion and diversity in mind? And then um, as we look at innovation and STEM, um, you know, one of, one of the things that we found, uh, and it's not a surprise, and we, we had found this earlier, is that many time um, underserved uh, segments of, of our population. And that's not just, even though uh, to sometimes folks say, well, Task Force One Navy is focused uh, on, on black officers and enlisted. It's, it's actually focused on all diversity. And so we know that if uh, a student who comes from a school district, whether they're white or black or male or female, Hispanic, they're not going to do as well on the ASVAB they're not going to do as well on, on advancement exams, or sometimes they will not, because they have not had the same uh, kind of uh, opportunity that perhaps you or I or others have had um, with, with our schooling. So that's an example 
of, of a finding that the task force um, certainly uh, reinforced, but it's also helping us with how do we get after that? It's those recommendations and, and some are what we can do on the enlisted side, some are on the officer side with programs, uh, in some cases working with historically black, black colleges and universities uh, or affinity groups uh, like the National Naval Officers Association, uh, which is, which is uh, African-American, the, the ANZO, which is a Hispanic affinity group, or uh, I'm going to be speaking shortly at the Joint Leaders Women's Symposium, but how do we help level that playing field for all? Again, trying to get after some of those systemic barriers. Those four lines of effort will have discrete recommendations on when we deliver the report in December, and that we'll give an interim report to all of our four stars tomorrow uh, on some areas that we think that we can uh, that we can uh, affect additional changes to. And, and I can certainly talk to you a little bit more about some of that. It sounds like the Navy took this opportunity of the Task Force One report to think broadly about all underrepresented groups in the Navy, um, not just racial minorities. But I do wonder if, if there's a general approach to DEI, di diversity, equity, and inclusion, or do needs differ? You know, does recruitment for, for black officers look the same as for, you know, enlisted women? Right, and, and the answer is um, there are some things that I think um, uh, are common approaches and then there's others where we do need to tailor the approach, um, uh, recognizing that, that it can be a little bit different uh, for different cohorts. I also wanna ask, you know, and you've been asked this in the press before, um, this isn't the Navy's first bite at this apple. Um, the uh, SECNAV had a, had a policy out in 2016 on diversity and inclusion, I believe. But of course, DOD writ large has had myriad commissions and efforts over the years. It has been a long time since the armed services were integrated. This continues to be a struggle for all the services. So I'm wondering if you think Task Force One Navy, if the outcomes will be different? And if so, why? What's going to make it different? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and, and I will just tell you, as we've been doing the listening sessions, both with sailors and the fleet, um, a, as part of Task Force One Navy, and we've done 11 of them, uh, or whether it's listening sessions that I've done with my own team here, so a little bit more personal in nature, there is a healthy skepticism that Task Force One Navy is not gonna be like a lot of the other task forces uh, that I think Admiral Daly and I and, and others who are listening have seen where um, you know something happens, you put a task force together, uh, you come up with recommendations, they go in a report and that report ends up sitting on a shelf until you have the next crisis in that same area three or four years later, you dust it off and you say, wow, why didn't we get after you know, issue number two, three, and four that had pretty actionable recommendations. I, I think, so the first thing that I would tell you is that the, the CNO has been very clear that this is about helping to affect enduring change. Um, the way that we think that that has to be done, because we will sundown Task Force One Navy, but about a year uh, to a year and a half ago, the Navy changed the way we're looking at culture because at the end of the day, this is about the culture and the ethos of the service. And so we, we went to um, what we call a culture of excellence. And we have a governance board um, that is, that is uh, very similar to what you see for the IMD Council tomorrow. The IMD Council nests within a culture of excellence governance board that is indeed all of the four-star admirals in the Navy um, it's chaired by the CNO uh, and it has other stakeholders, but there's a campaign plan um, that is associated with it. Um, some of the things that it's designed to get after are things like signature behaviors, how do you reduce destructive behaviors, but, but the fourth line of effort there, and we're in the military, right? So we do campaign plans and we, you know, then we, and we dig in and we do poems, et cetera. Um, but the fourth line of effort is inclusion and diversity. And so we will, we will um, robust 
that line of effort in the campaign plan. And then we meet uh, twice a year with the four stars. And then we, and then we meet once a month with sub elements. And, and that's where we look at what's our plan? How are we performing to the plan? And then what are our metrics to tell us if we're making a difference? And, and so it's by instituting it in that so that it's not just about Admiral Gilday being CNO or John Nowell being CNP that, that we have institutionalized uh, getting after that. And I would argue that we've um, ebbed and flowed a little bit about how deliberate we've been in, in the past. It's not that, that, we, <clears throat> that since Admiral Zumwalt really spearheaded efforts in the 70s that we've not considered it very important but I would argue that, that there were times where we had our eye firmly fixed on the ball, and there were times where uh, perhaps we took our eye off that ball a little bit. Um, that's the way we are looking at making this enduring, is by institutionalizing as part of that culture of excellence. Does that, does that make sense? I know it can sound a little bit like you live in Washington, D.C., and you've came up, you, you came up with a slick governance scheme, but I, I, do think it's, I do think this is different. Well, and you mentioned in there culture and institutions. So my follow-up question to that, to, to put a finer point on it, is as you bring or try to bring more underrepresented minority groups into the Navy, um, you of course are working with the majority group, which is generally white and male. Um, and so I'm curious how that group has been responding to this because all minority groups through American history have made the point that it takes alliance with the majority to get their, you know, to get representation and rights. So I'm curious how that, that sort of demographic majority in the Navy is, is taking this on. Yeah, so I, I think that, um, well, one, I will just tell you that, that based upon the feedback that we have gotten as we have um, sort of sent updates out to them of they, as they have been doing their listening sessions, um, this, uh, I, I think that most of us, uh, many of us, certainly many white males, did believe that we probably, you know, from our vantage point, that we'd made more progress here uh, than perhaps a counterpart who's African American, who's Hispanic, uh, or who's female is. And it's not that we weren't listening there, but, but to be quite honest, I, I don't think it was as personal, right? And it is easy to get defensive, but I, I've been, I've been, uh, pretty pleased, and I am the Navy's by by uh, by definition the Navy's chief inclusion and diversity officer. Okay, I'm formally designated there, and as I look at that, uh, I I think they have responded well. But I but I do think that for all, um, when we do the listening sessions, I think sometimes they do get very hard, and um, and it gets uncomfortable uh, for senior leaders. I think it it gets uncomfortable sometimes for our shipmates who are trying to articulate um, some of the pain they're feeling. Um, and it's, uh, you know, but, but I think it's just so necessary. So I, I think your question really is, do you feel like we have the weight of the flag wardroom and the senior enlisted, right? That chief's mess behind us. And, and, uh, and I think by and large, we do. Um, and, and this is a journey and it's got to be a sustained journey. Um, you know, speaking of the, the, the breakdown uh, of representation in, in the Navy, across all the services, one of the critiques uh, has been in statistical sense, um, you know, the enlisted ranks are actually quite representative of the United States these days. All the services are, are doing fairly well. Um, but the officer corps continues to be, um, you know, very white and very male. Um, the Navy has about 34% of naval officers are from minority groups is the stat I could find. I had a little more trouble finding the stats for flag officers. So again, a struggle for other services in promotion to, to flag or general officer rank. Can you talk a little bit about um, the work there, where the Navy is at and where you'd like to get to? Yeah, I sure can. So one, the Navy is not where we, where we would like to be. Um, we do not have enough representation in the flag ranks. Um, we're doing better on the senior enlisted side as you look at command master chiefs, uh, you know, and, uh, and our senior enlisted leaders. And as you mentioned, 
Um, some of that is because, you know, if, if you're not bringing enough diversity in the front door, then it doesn't matter how good our retention rates are. Um, we, we cannot keep enough to then get folks to a senior level. And we know that's important. So again, that's true uh, across uh, all, all types of, you know, uh, diversity, race, gender, ethnicity. Uh, to put a fine point on that. Um, so for African Americans, about 13% of the population is African American. We would like both the officers and in the enlisted to, to be representative of that. We're actually much higher than that on the enlisted side. And oh, by the way, um, we do see that, that, um, that demographically, as you get to petty officer, first class, chief, senior chief, master chief, um, that diverse cohort is doing quite well. Um, on the officer side, we're simply not bringing, we're not bringing enough diversity in the front door. Um, we're only bringing in about 8% uh, uh, of our, uh, on the officer side is uh, African American. And, and as you look at, um, at what we're bringing uh, in, uh, I, we can't hope to get those numbers. So we, we did, I will tell you, doctor, we recognize that, um, we have recognized that. Uh, and so we were already starting down the path of how do we, how do we um, both uh, get the word out in, uh, in better fashion to all of our communities. So we've been working with affinity groups to get to influencers. Uh, we've been working uh, our line of effort number four on innovation in STEM. Um, how do we get to the junior high, uh, you know, level um, to attract uh, folks uh, into more STEM-related education? Because we are a technical uh, service. We started with things like our uh, NROTC preparatory program, where universities uh, will will work with us to take uh, candidates who may not have the academic background um, to start their freshman year in college, but that have a lot of promise. And, and the universities, we've got about 100 um, students this year and about uh, 20 universities around the country that the university will pay their room and board uh, and, and, the, uh, and, and all of their fees. And then the Navy says, we'll give them a four-year scholarship uh, if they can get through that program. About 70% of that uh, of that group is diverse. So how do we how do we continue to ramp up how we bring more uh, folks in? And then how do we also get them into um, into career fields that have upward mobility? One one issue uh, that that we have, um, and we're working this by community, is that on the officer side. If you are a, a what we call a restricted line or a staff corps officer, right? Um, so a supply corps officer, a civil engineering corps officer, um, a human resources officer, then you kind of have a glass ceiling when it comes to the flag deck. You're not gonna make, in general, uh, three or four star. Most of our three and four stars are gonna be folks that are ship drivers or aviators or submariners. So we know we also have to do a better job um, preparing um, those midshipmen to feel comfortable applying for those communities. And then once in those communities, how, and again, it's a level playing field for all. We want it to be a level playing field for all, but how do we make sure that as we look at both administrative screening boards and promotion boards, that, that we are keeping enough uh, folks as they go through because it takes us 30 years to build a flag officer. Unlike industry, you know, if I lack diversity in a corporation, I just hire it in. We can't do that. So we, we are focusing uh, very, very heavily. Uh, we were before we stood up Task Force One Navy. Task Force One Navy is helping us to look at additional opportunity at how to uh, bring more diversity in that front door, and then how to manage better during folks' careers. Um, you'll uh, one of the ways that I've kind of described it is that um, it, uh, is the Navy a meritocracy. 
Yes, we are. But is it a level playing field for all? Um, not necessarily. That's not willfully. It's not that we've said, let's make it uneven. But again, if you go back to that example of what kind of education did you have before you came in, you have effects like that that then bleed over and that we have to figure out how do we help remove that barrier at the front end so that, again, in, in the case of a flag officer, uh, 30 years later, 25 to 30 years later, we have enough diversity coming in front of a flag board so that we, we see repre uh, representatively the same kind of demographic coming out, if all that makes sense. That was a little long-winded, I apologize. No, that's good. I'm gonna ask one more follow-up question to that before I turn to the really good audience questions we have waiting here. And it's just that sure. you were really specific about recruitment and promotion, and then you touched on retention, but I just wanna push you to be a little more specific on the specific retention challenges for people from underrepresented, underrepresented groups in the Navy. You know, what, what pushes people of color out? What pushes women out? And how do you reverse those trends and get them to stay in? Yeah, so, you know, it's, um, so we have, 17, um, we have 17 communities, if you will, in the Navy. Uh, and and we, we call them our families, our tribes. It's, it's uh, you know, it's, and that's really where the rubber meets the road. So uh, for me, as CNP, of course, I'm non-parochial uh, across communities, but, but you have the surface community, you have the aviation community, um, you have the submarine community, and quite frankly, um, it's, it's how do you make sure within those communities that we're paying attention to leveraging inclusion and diversity, okay? Um, and again, this is not about make, making the playing field um, unfair for one group. You know, one, one, it's, not, it's not about, um, you know, someone gets something to the detriment of someone else. It is though about making sure that everyone gets uh, the appropriate advocacy in addition to the mentoring. Um, and so it's, we're focusing a lot on that. And there are some communities where it's harder than others. You know, for instance, um, for females, uh, we, we have aviation has always been a community where it's been harder, I think, for our female officers to, to look at managing a, a family uh, as well as their career. Now, it's hard for males, too. I'm not saying that it's not, but arguably it's different. And so some things we can do across the entire Navy. Um, in that particular case, the career intermission program was an example that was designed to try and help out with uh, perhaps a female uh, sailor officer enlisted who wanted to take some time to start a family, freeze frame their career, then come back in. And then in other cases, it is, you know, on the aviation side, type model series do we have a culture that welcomes that diversity and then, and then helps promote it and, and talks to uh, those individuals about staying in that community? Because we do see, Doctor, that an inordinate um, number of females and, uh, and diverse uh, officers, for instance, tend to leave the unrestricted line Mm -hmm. Okay, and and go to the restricted line and staff corps, and we still want to keep them in the Navy. It's not that we don't v highly value those, uh, you know, those communities, but but by the same token, again, there then then you've sort of got a glass ceiling where it's hard for them to get above a certain level. So we're looking very hard at that, and we're doing it uh, with folks like the Air Boss or the SWO Boss. Etc. amongst and across those communities. I've got some questions here um, from audience members. Number one is from Lieutenant Commander James McLaughlin, uh, U.S. Navy. He says, could you provide some metrics which detail the career progressions of some of our diverse groups? I guess he wants to hear the story of it. Um, well, so I, so I would, uh, well, let me give you, actually, I'll give, I'll give James uh, some numbers, and I appreciate uh, that question. So, um, for instance, as we look at our African American officers, um, I, I mentioned that uh, that we're bringing in about eight percent. 
um, and, and the demographic is about 13%. We're actually doing a pretty good job with keeping those African American officers in uh, well into their career and many times all the way up to captain. The problem is that, again, we, we see that there is uh, sort of a transition for many um, to RL or staff corps. On women, um, typically, uh, although we've made great inroads and we're bringing in about 25% uh, females across both officer and enlisted cohorts, you know, the, the population is about 50%, but we've, we've steadily been increasing the number of female um, accessions. On the officer side, um, we've typically seen their retention to be far less than males, and it does differ uh, by community. Um, in the surface community, uh, it, it's, um, I would say that males are retaining at about 35%. And, and when we talk to that, that's kind of getting them from division officer to department head, okay? But then women were only retaining uh, at somewhere in the low 20s, okay? Now that is up from about 18%, for instance, about 15, uh, 10 to 15 years ago. Um, one of the things that, that, one of the stats that I looked at recently, it was very heartening though, is that, you know, for submarine service, we fairly recently introduced females. That started in 2011. We did it first with officers, then with enlisted sailors. And, and actually we're seeing, um, we're seeing retention rates for our female submariners um, fairly equivalent to what we're seeing for our, our male submariners in the, in the mid to high 20s. So that's, that I think is a good news story. But so we can, we can track that across, um, you know, both, promotion as well as advancement, uh, as well as uh, administrative screening boards. Um, because uh, one question is, how many are you promoting? And then the other question is, so what does it look like as you look at progressing from division officer to department head to executive officer and, and CO? And, we, and so we track all of that. And how we get after that differs a little bit by each community and at each level if that makes sense. Um, second question from a Commander Scotch Purdue, JAG C, US Navy, in an article by Robert Livingston, he says in this month's Harvard Business Review, um, Livingston notes, if your employees don't believe that racism exists in the company, then diversity initiatives will be perceived as the problem, not, not the solution. Um, what would you say to those in the Navy who think racism is not a significant issue requiring diversity initiatives like this? Yeah, I, I think what I would say is, um, and, and certainly uh, what we've heard at our listening session, and, and as we look at the demographics, um, it's, uh, I, I think that, that we do need to understand that again, systemic racism uh, does not necessarily mean um, that we have willfully put barriers up uh, to make sure that, uh, again, that we have that level playing field. And, and you know, we actually brought in um, a highly qualified expert, Dr. Chuck Barber. Uh, you may have read some of what uh, he has both written as well as uh, he's done a couple interviews lately. And, and so this was, a, the idea here was let's get somebody who specializes in inclusion and diversity um, to give us a look through a different lens to make sure that, that there's nothing we're missing there. The way that Chuck uh, talks to this is that he, he, he then talks to systemic inequality. And so, um, so do, do, we, do we know that we have that? Um, yes. Is it in society? Yeah. Um, so naturally, we're going to have it in the military. And again, it's really not about anyone, I think, in most cases, um, willfully putting up those barriers, but it is about understanding that there are barriers there. We need to understand what they are. And as I talk to you about those four lines of effort, it's how do we systemically, how do we systematically get after breaking some of those barriers down? Um, but I do think that if folks don't believe there's a problem, then it's hard to get them to embrace the solution. 
Uh, our last question that I have for you is from John Lee, who says he's active duty Navy, doesn't identify his rank. Um, he asks, how does the Navy balance the desire to have a more diverse leadership versus finding the quote, best person for the job? I am a person of color myself, he says, and would find it reassuring if my promotion is due to my performance and qualifications alone, not the color of my skin or my ethnicity. Yeah, I think that's a great question too. And I promise you um, that if someone is promoted, it is, it is based upon their merit, not their skin color, not their gender, not their ethnicity. Uh, and, and I'll say that one more time. This is not about um, this is not about picking someone because we're trying to meet uh, a quota uh, or or um, it, it's about um, best and fully qualified. That is what the precepts and convening orders for both our promotion boards, our statutory boards, as well as our administrative screening boards uh, do. And, you know, I, I, I think that highlights a, a good point, and it's one that I've heard uh, from some of my African-American shipmates. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it, it's hard sometimes for them because, you know, if they promote, uh, some feel like others will look at them and say, you promoted because you're African-American, okay? Um, and, and so that's a kind of a double burden right? Uh, I think what I would want all the folks that are listening to know um, is that at the end of the day, even though, so what, I, what I've said is we are absolutely a meritocracy, okay? So then it becomes about the playing field. And, um, and so uh, there, there is no one, uh, I think, and I'm very, very comfortable uh, because I do look at all of the stats for our promotion boards like many. I've sat on many uh, promotion boards and administrative screening boards. And, you know, our boards are not perfect, um, but, but I think as they apply that best and fully qualified mandate, and that is first and foremost, I'm very comfortable that we're picking the right folks. At the end of the day, though, um, we cannot, we can't pick um, officers where we get diversity unless we can bring them into a board, which means we have to bring enough diversity in, we have to keep it, we have to nurture it just like we nurture everyone. Because if you don't mind, Doctor, I'll loop back to kind of um, one of the things we talked about at the beginning. I don't, I don't ever just, um, you know, just talk to inclusion and diversity with respect to just race, ethnicity, or gender. It's always about um, diversity of experience, diversity of where you went to school, how you grew up, um, what lens do you look through? And we know that that will make us a better team. It's about warfighting readiness. Um, so I, I think it's important to, to always kind of loop back around uh, to that um, because uh, we're in great power competition. Um, we've seen how rapidly China is, is, um, is progressing technically, uh, technologically and tactically. We've seen a resurgent Russia. We've got to have uh, the best sailors, officer and enlisted. Um, we have to leverage the diversity that they bring and how we look at uh, the issue. And then we've got to be able to rapidly um, adapt and overcome. And it's only a diverse team that's operated uh, inclusively that can do it, and and that's what that's what the CNO is all about. So I hope that I hope that helps with this question. Um, I I promise you that as um, as we consider folks for boards, if someone shouldn't be uh, does not make the cut, uh, being of a particular race, ethnicity, or gender will not get them over that bar. Well, Vice Admiral Nowell, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak so candidly and honestly today with us about everything you're doing and everything the Navy's doing on this important topic. Um, I want to mention before we go that um, our partners at the Naval Institute have an essay contest um, that they are running right now. Um, and if you want to submit an essay about diversity and inclusion in the sea services, uh, please do so. You can find more information on usni.org. 
Deadline for submission is January 31st, 2021. Um, I also want to thank um, HII for their sponsorship of the Maritime Security Dialogue Series. Uh, and again, in these virtual environments, it's very strange not to have a round of applause, but uh, imagine a virtual round of applause for the Admiral today. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you.